Yeah, so CDS Arc, which is a, a self-hosted compiler for a subset of C, JavaScript and Arc. So why bother? So C compiler is not generally installed by default. Even if a C compiler is installed, there's no guarantee that N2 systems will have the same C compiler installed. This means that if you distribute C source code, there's no guarantee people can build it. And even if they can build it, there's no guarantee it will work correctly on, on any two given systems. And this issue is particularly bad on odd systems like Linux. So the solution would be to write a C compiler that can be built from a, wide, a more widely installed language, such as something like JavaScript. So an even better solution, though, is to write a C compiler which is simultaneously a valid subset of C, JavaScript, and ARC. So that way, if you've got a C compiler, you can, run, you can run it, you can just compile it and run it that way. Or if you've got a web page, you can just run your web page. Or if you've got Node.js, you can run it on Node.js. Or if you've got ARC, which people might not be familiar with, which is um, essentially it's a scripting language which is available on every POSIX system, you know, essentially every um, Unix system available. So the end result is you're able to get exactly the same C compiler uh, installed on, on every system. So, so what I set up was essentially several different bootstrap paths that you can run, one of which is into Explorer. But essentially each, for each platform there's a bit of support code to run the, on the compiler, and then you essentially use the compiler to rebuild a self-hosted version of the compiler, uh, which then emits uh, this cjsort.m1 file, which is um, like a macro assembly output file. Because the, this a compiler essentially takes a source code and turns it into assembly language. So this is the, um, this is the support code for C. So essentially there's a couple of macro definitions. You define var to be int and you define function to be int, which means that when you pass JavaScript code into it, uh, that uh, it essentially can be compiled to C that way. You have to write in a subset to make it actually compile, but it's how, you, it's how you make it compile. Then you hash include some support code and then you hash include cjs.org.js, which is actually the JavaScript, JavaScript compiler itself. And the JavaScript and ARC versions of this are a bit more, a bit more elaborate. So building the C-based version, essentially you just go GCC, compile the, um, the C-based version of it, get cgsart.gcc, run cgsart.gcc against the self-hosted version of the compiler, and then you get cgsart.m1, macro assembly language output. So, and there's a um, JavaScript path with Node.js and ARC path, and there's also a web browser version, which looks like this. So on the left-hand side, that's the, uh, the source code of the, of the compiler, the full, self, the full self-hosted source code of the compiler. Right-hand side is the macro assembly language it spits out. And what's worth noting here as well is it also hashes the output, and that hash, uh, that SHA-256, some of the outputs, is identical regardless of which bootstrap path you use. And you can also see it took 49 seconds to rebuild itself. Not 49 seconds, 49, 49 milliseconds to rebuild itself with itself. So. Um, but as I mentioned, I've been talking about assembly language. You also need an assembler and a linker to actually generate machine code and executables to be able to run them. So within the project, there's also a macro assembler called m0.js and a hex2 link, hex2, well, a linker which is called hex2.js, which are also written in the same restricted dialect. So this, this here kind of illustrates the full process end to end of compiling the self hosted version down to assembly language, compiling the assembly language down to object code, hex2, and then compiling the object code down to executable cdsorg.exe. And then you repeat, repeat the same process again for all three tools. So then when, you, when you've done that, you can actually verify that it can rebuild itself with itself. So on the left-hand side, you run the, the platform version. You then generate the self-hosted version, cdsorg.exe. You then rebuild itself with itself to get cgsarc2.exe and those two files at the end are a bit identical, which, which means that the whole thing is self-hosted and capable of re rebuilding itself and it's under itself a bit identically. So, next. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm kind of rattling through things. I think I need to slow, slow down a little bit. So, this is sort of digging through the source code of the compiler. The compiler itself is around about 1,000 lines of code. It's partially derived from another C compiler called M2Planet but has been heavily cut down, well, heavily cut it down and modified it uh, with a rewritten tokenizer and code generator. Uh, the macro assembler is about 500 lines, the link is about 400 lines of code. So digging down further, program is kind of the top level program, function actually compiles your program. So digging down just a little bit, things worth noting. As I mentioned, it's in the subset of um, C, which is also valid JavaScript and ARC. So we've got to do things like, there's no local variables in ARC, so therefore you've got to define a wrapper function so for program, we have a local variable called LTOC, 
Um, but we can't use local variables, so we essentially have a wrapper function that calls that, which then uses it as a dummy, dummy parameter. Uh, the NC uh, function reads a character into CH, the NT function reads a token into TOC. And then other things worth noting about the code on the left-hand side is all, all arithmetic and logical operations must be done via function calls. Um, while is the only available loop construct, uh, if, else, if, else and break are also supported in terms of control flow, which you can see there at the bottom. So zooming even further, just into the main loop of the, of the compiler itself, we can pass global declarations of the form var foo semicolon or int foo sem semicolon, and we can pass function declarations of the form uh, function foo open paren or int foo open paren. So essentially, if you've, got, if you've got token, token, semicolon, you've got a global variable. If you've got token, token, open paren, you've got a function declaration. So digging down again, if I declare global, if we encounter a declaration of the form var foo, we will then emit the assembly language colon global foo null, where colon is a label and null reserves four, by, reserves four bytes of storage for that. And then once you once you pass that, you just skip over the semicolon at the end, which you can see there with a the skip on the left hand side. So declare function, which is a bit more bit more complicated, but I've kind of cut this down to kind of highlight the important bits of it. So collect arguments passes the argument list. Once you've done that, you see what the next token is. If the next token is a semicolon, if you've got a function prototype, you can just skip it. Uh, if the next token is a curly paren, it's a function, and then you start compiling the function. So the first thing you do when you compile the function is you miss colon function name, or colon function function name, so colon function foo. And then to pass the, uh, sorry, then, then you carry on passing and compiling the rest of the function with um, the function called statement. So collect arguments. You have an argument, arguments list like this, so function foo abc. And essentially what the, the collect arguments function does is it takes, takes that list of um, tokens, abc, and just essentially pushes it into an array. So on the left hand side, essentially what it does, the collect arguments function does, is it takes, it consumes tokens until it encounters a close paren. If it encounters a, a comma or an integer token, it skips them. Anything else it pushes, in, uh, pushes into the arguments array. So, so I'm not going to go through all this because it's a bit complicated, but this is uh, the main body which passes um, the function, function bodies essentially. So basically it's an if else chain that dispatches the process and of each, each um, keyword that's available within the language. And there's not many, not many keywords available because it's a very cut down dialect. And anything that's not a keyword is treated as, a, as an expression. So then zooming out, the general structure, I'm not going to go through all that because obviously there's a lot to it, but the general structure of the, of the um, CTSR compiler mirrors the grammar of the CTSR dialect of C. So it's essentially just a recursive attempt parser. So it's like program at the top, you know, then there's a declare global, declare function, collect arguments, process various tokens, and then there's a simple expression pass at the bottom, which can't handle operation, uh, operators like add and subtract and stuff, but it can do things like function calls. Um, comments are handled by the tokenizer. Um, it's also got a language extension, uh, so it can, actually, it can actually use assembly language as well within, within the CTSR extended dialect. And the reason behind that is because, as, as I just mentioned, we don't have the ability to, to actually compile operators. So if you've got like a divide, you can't actually write that, you can't express that in the code. So in order to implement that, what you do is you write your, so this is the CJSR self-hosted version of the div function. And essentially you just include inline assembly language, which, which um, implements div, a divide, so idiv ebx, that's the actual division operation at the bottom. And on the left hand side is the actual seeing JavaScript version of the code, you'll notice that I actually always zero on each of those. And that's because in JavaScript, the number type is a, is a double. Uh, but I want everything to be 32 bit integers for consistency be between all three languages. So if you take a double and you do a bitwise always zero, it, co it coerces it into a 32 bit signed integer. Uh, and on the ORC version down there at the bottom, uh, ORC doesn't have um, the bitwise OR operator. And actually, it doesn't also have a bitwise or function either. So I had to implement this or function in order to actually get consistency with ARC as well. Um, so that kind of so that kind of go, that kind of goes through the language. So you've got like yeah, a, a simplified language with no operators and everything done via function calls, and it's completely kind of self-hosted under itself. So going beyond CGS ARC, 
which I'm kind of really, I realise I'm really rattling through this. Um, I ported a pre existing C99 compiler to this dialect. Uh, the, the C99 compiler is called Peanut. Uh, and then I was able to use this compiler to compile the Tiny C compiler, which is a kind of more complete C compiler. So essentially, the bootstrap path for that is CJSTALK EXE, Peanut, and then to the Tiny C compiler. And this is kind of, I'll, I'll show you this in a second running actually. The, yeah, and what, and what it does essentially at the bottom there, you see me running this Tiny C compiler, and it just prints out its version number. But I also verify the SHA-256 sum of the, of the TCC compiler, and that is identical regardless of what um, bootstrap path you use to get to this point. And I think that's more or less, more or less it. That was rattling through it. I've probably got a lot of stuff. I hopefully, hopefully I spoke loud enough, but uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Two-part question. All right. Two. Two-part question. First part, now that I've seen this, how can I unsee it? <laughs> well, to, some of this is, is based on kind of adapted and well, heavily adapted versions of some pre-existing work as well. Yeah, uh, I think but, it's really, really cool. Uh, yeah. My real question actually is, you know, you, you talked about um, compiling a more complete version of C. Yes. I mean, presumably you could extend that pretty much indefinitely. It sounds yeah. like you could kind of use this to bootstrap basically anything because yeah, everything it, is built on top of C. Right? Yes, but yeah, essentially it, this can wire up to another project called Live Bootstrap, which will go all the way up to GCC and, and beyond. It can build a yeah. Linux kernel and stuff like that. Yeah, so. you could, you could so, yeah. You, yeah, com compile and run yeah. a, a Python interpreter or a JSON. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Or, and yeah. and the, the Live Bootstrap project, which is another kind of bootstrapping project, it's, it does that. So it actually walks up multiple versions of Python to get to the latest one. Yeah, that's so, really, really yeah. cool. So you, talk, you, you kind of, at the beginning, yeah. you talked a little bit about use cases. You said, you know, you might have machines that don't have a C compiler installed yep. on them. Um, is, is, is this, like, is it, is, it kind, is it more of just a kind of a fun project or are there, like, more genuine example use cases where this has actually been, been used to solve a... A, yeah, a really like like if you problem. don't want, if you want to audit every single piece of code in a project, uh, you can't have like you know like hundred megabytes clang binaries and stuff. You have to kind of start off simple and work your way up. And this can actually start from, I think it can actually start from um, what is it, like uh, five hundred bytes worth of machine code which you have to audit, and then beyond then you just build up through compiler versions. So, and I actually ran the the bootstrap process there. So it takes about 48 seconds to get up to the Tiny C compiler. And then you go, oh, artifacts, TTC, boots, yes. Yeah, there you go, that's it running. Yeah. So, did I baffle everybody or? <laughs> Deeply jealous of the low levelness of this. Like the, the most language stuff that I do is using like Antler as a whole framework for hmm. uh, you know, doing this stuff and you've, handwritten some like recursive descent stuff in there. Yeah. So. I mean to, to be honest, the I I, re, I wrote the tokenizer from scratch. The recursive descent part is partially based on this other compiler, but it's it's kind of heavily adapted. But yeah. So I didn't start from a completely blank slate, but yeah, but it was kind of nearly there. And yeah, the, cut the it down to a thousand lines. Yeah. And an applaud, you know, well done. <laughs> All right. Any other questions from the audience? Cool. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.